Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, good wherever you are. Um, this is Chris Hewer, and I'm actually coming to you right now from Dublin, Ireland, here at Web Summit. And we're joined today by Dave Gray uh, of Explain and Liminal Thinking and so many other things, author of Game Storming and, and gosh, so many other books, a connected company, very instrumental and influential to me in my life. Um, Dave's a longtime friend and disclaimer, he's also an advisor to my company, so kind of our friends and know each other. Um, but, uh, you know, we uh, jump into the topic. Um, this is CXD now, customer experience design now, because the time for customer experience design is now. And it's really a zeitgeist moment. So we're very excited to be diving into this topic. Thanks to IBM Commerce, our, our sponsor, uh, their new product, uh, Journey Designer, which helps to actually create journey maps. And uh, really great long-term vision. We'll talk about it some other time. But Dave, thank you so very much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's really great to be here. It's great to see you, Chris. Yeah, it's been a little while. It's too long yeah. in person, too, by the way. You're looking very good. Uh, apparently, I'm four stones lighter now. So. <laughs> All right, nice. Well done. I, I still don't know what a stone is, but, you know, whatever. <laughs> Feels like I lost a gallstone. That's another story. Hey, um, so what I want to do here in this, in this first segment is actually get to a little bit more of your background. Um, you know, obviously, you've been talking about this idea and maybe even, I don't even know if you used this language early on. Um, obviously, visual thinking and visual communications is really kind of your, you know, wheelhouse, if you will. Um, but how did you really start getting into thinking about this empathetic approach to communications marketing and, and broadly this idea of customer experience design? Well, that's a... Uh... Uh, I'll try and do the quick version. It's a lot, not an easy and quick story to tell, but okay. my background was in information design. I used to be a journalist doing information graphics for uh, newspapers. And uh, what that process is a process, it's a journalistic process, is a process of going and in, uh, kind of like any journalist, you, you find the story and based on the story, you um, go out and you try and get the information and, and present it back in a way that's meaningful and useful to people. And the cert, there are certain kinds of stories that are very, um, uh, that are very hard to tell in a linear way as just a, a word story. You know, for example, um, something, of, you know, anything that has any kind of complexity to it, where there are a lot of moving parts and things that connect, is much easier to talk about with um, visual, uh, visual uh, story. And so I would go out and uh, I would work with uh, people to try and understand some kind of complex or potentially confusing information. And usually that day, I would have to go back and put uh, it together into a newspaper, a picture for the newspaper, infographic. And today, a lot more people know what an infographic is. Uh, back then, I found myself explaining it a lot. But what is, uh, to me... When I, in, in the early 90s, 1990s, so I was going back quite a ways, it became very evident to me that newspapers were uh, um, kind of on the decline as an industry, as a business. And if I wanted to, uh, you know, think ahead about my future as a, a person in the world who had a job, that I was going to have to think beyond newspapers. And so I, my, my thought at the time was, well, infographics are really valuable. They're going to live beyond newspapers. They're a very good way to transmit a lot of information of, of high degree of complexity very quickly and very easily. People are visual. People understand visual information you know, they much more intuitively and rapidly. So I thought, well, I'll start a company doing infographics for, for businesses. Um, there's a lot of complexity. Um, and uh, even if newspapers go away, complexity is not going away. Confusion is not going away. We're going to still need to understand things and they'll still need, still need to explain things. So I called my company Explain and I started this in uh, 1993. And the, the most, one of the early and very, most interesting discoveries going into the business world and doing visual, trying to do visual explanations. So companies have strategies that they need to execute. Companies have all kinds of um, they have information that needs to be conveyed across the organization that's sometimes very complex. So visualization turns out to be a great way to do that, a great way to um, communicate stuff. But what I did not anticipate that was even more interesting was the process that we would go through to create an infographic was a design thinking process itself. And in fact, 
what I realized pretty early on was that the the process of creating the infographic was way more valuable than the infographic itself <laughs> because the process of creating it is the process of coming to alignment and agreement and uh, uh, figuring out sometimes, you know, a strategy, there's a lot of unknowns and a lot of empty spaces and a lot of complexity confusion between a strategy and a blue binder that you get from uh, McKinsey and what actually people do when they actually hit the ground running. So uh, in other words, we, we weren't creating infographics of things that people already knew and we just had to pull it out of them. We were, the, inf the process of creating the infographic is the process of figuring it out. <laughs> How are we going to do this? Um, who does what and when? Um, who needs to be involved? What happens next? What happens after that? What if we do that? What if we do that? And it turns out that um, drawing a picture is a really powerful thing when a group of people start doing it together. And um, what we've evolved into, uh, what my company has evolved into over the uh, 20 so years since then is that's actually what we do. We, you know, their companies are typically um, not good at uh, communicating internally. They're not very, uh, they're not good often at listening to themselves. And uh, so, and there's all kinds of uh, complexity and confusion and even misinformation that's flowing around. And, and when a company isn't explaining something, it's uh, people will fill that vacuum and so we found that there are really three big categories in companies that are often disconnected. One is the, um, and you could kind of call them the, the heart, the mind, and the hand. So the, the heart of the company is in the culture and in the way that people operate and the way that people do things, and kind of the standard ways of routines and so forth, but also the, the human aspect, the people aspect. Um, the head is the, uh, the, the sort of the, the clarity engine of the company that, the, the, the head is where all the logic and the thinking gets done. That's your typical Bain or McKinsey type of uh, consulting work. And then the hands are the actual frontline people who gets things done. And we, uh, if you almost think of it as a triangle and, and as a firm, what we ended up doing was we're kind of get, sitting in the center of that. And we're a catalyst for the company to help them talk to each other, listen to each other, visualize information. And it's it's, a, it's, it's amazing how powerful that is when you can get all those things synchronized. And um, so we just, uh, um, you know, it's funny, we don't always create infographics anymore, but we're running these sort of, we're creating these experiences that allow people to uh, listen and think and make and really co-design everything that they're going to do. So um, we, we used to think of ourselves as a communication company, but now we... Uh, we actually call ourselves a strategy activation firm because that's where we're going for companies. How has the how has the process evolved from you for the early days when you started yeah. when you started trying to understand the process to where you are now? Yeah, well, in the early days, it was just me. You know, it was just like, oh, Dave, it's some kind of magic. Let's just send Dave out. He's the only one who can get on a plane and make this magic happen. And then I started trying to figure out, okay. Uh, I'm getting a little tired of being on airplanes all the time. Uh, how can I deconstruct this uh, this magic and start to make it something that is a little more repeatable and scalable? And uh, that eventually, over time, that became uh, the game storming book. I mean, that that sort of internal manual of how do we do this? How do we operate? Um, how do we run events and experiences that help people do this kind of thinking and communicating and design work together? And uh, that is out there. It's a kind of a it's sort of a recipe book uh, that is uh, for people who want to design these uh, kind of um, experiences where you're uh, kind of co-creating and designing uh, work. And the uh, it, it turns out it's useful in lots of other things. There's lots of teachers who are using it in education. They're using it to change, to try to transform the classrooms from, from something that's kind of top down teacher to students that's more student driven. And it's actually happening in lots of other places, but game storming became a, um, and it's continually, it's still evolving. And there's a, a website where we keep, I think we have a, at least two or, or maybe even three times as many exercises on the, uh, on the website now as we originally had in the book. So it, it, that toolkit is, is it continuing to evolve? And, um, uh, and I think what, what has happened is we have moved from being primarily a information design firm to being really 
much more like a management consulting firm that is focused on strategy execution. And we're, we're, what we're really doing is we're picking up where most uh, strategy consultants leave off, which is like, here's your strategy. <laughs> and then the, we sort of, uh, we sort of talk to the, uh, the executive who just got the binder and it's like their job to go do this thing now. And, um, uh, and uh, we're there to turn around and say, okay, well, let's actually figure out what this means and how to translate that into, you know, because you can't just t- hand that blue binder to the uh, barista at the Starbucks store and say, here, <laughs> there's a lot of translation that has to happen between the, uh, to make that thing come true. And, um, you know, a lot of people think of design as, you know, people are going to design a new service or start from a blue sky or they're going to design a new product and they're thinking about, you know, how do we just start from zero and, and design the perfect spatula or whatever. Um, but design, I love the Steve Jobs quote, uh, design is how it works. And, you know, in an organization, design is how the organization works. So we, you know, if you're, every organization has what it is today and what it's trying to become. And there's always that tension between what it is and what it's trying to become. And um, what it's to help the organization realize its potential, you have to actually um, enable those conversations to happen, the people to make those, have those thoughts. And, you know, drawing is actually a really good way to simulate something. Like if you're, if you were going to go on an expedition to the North Pole tomorrow or next week, this week would be a good time to kind of be drawing a picture of what you would need and thinking it through, you know, and like, so, um, and this is true for any kind of strategy uh, or initiative that a company is undergoing, um, you kind of need to do that expedition planning. And that's not part of the strategic process. It's part of the, uh, you know, I don't know, it's not always even part of the planning process because a lot of times that planning is about numbers and goals on spreadsheets and uh, maybe, uh, I mean, a lot of it lives in in, uh, Excel files and that kind of stuff. And that doesn't actually translate to action very easily. So, I'm all about action. I like to, as you know, Chris, as you've heard me when I hammer on you, advising you as a, as a company, as a startup guy, I'm all about like, let's get traction. Let's actually make things happen. I get excited when things start happening. And um, that's why I love just, I love the work that I do because we're, you know, we're in there with companies. We're helping them turn the gears faster and just uh, helping the rubber hit the road. And it's, it's super exhilarating. It's super fun. To, to what extent do you think, um, or, or, or let me say this again differently, um, were you influenced by Disney and the Imagineering concept at all when you started thinking about this? I was, well, you know, it's funny you say Disney. I was, uh, I, when I was starting my company, I was fascinated by a few people and Steve Jobs was one of them and Walt Disney was another. I read a lot of biographies. Um, I actually le- read a lot of military uh, history and some a lot of, I really was for a long time. I was really into biographies and Walt Disney is a fascinating character. And I think probably even more than uh, Steve Jobs to me, Walt Disney was a guy who had a, um, uh, a mind that could envision amazing things. And like um, we, uh, what he, um, well, he's just a brilliant guy. I mean, he had a picture in his head of a of a world, a literal world, and then he made it happen. I mean, it's it's tre- tre- just tremendously exciting how, what the things that he was able to do. And I, if you look at if you go back and look at how Walt Disney scaled and grew that company, um, you you can find some really cool visualizations. I think he there's one that I have in mind, and I, I can try and find it and give you the link after the this uh, podcast, but. He actually did a, a diagram showing how all the different pieces of the Disney uh, empire fit together and how they all contributed and fit within one another and reinforced each other, um, you know, from like animated films to the experiences in the theme parks. And he, he was a true systems thinker, a brilliant man. So, yes, absolutely. Cool, cool. Well, we're almost over with this segment, but I've got one more story I need to hear from you. And actually, I just realized I've never asked you about this before. How I came to know of your work was Business 2.0 magazine mm. and always just being so blown away by the infographics that you built for them and your little uh, famous now, infamous now, stick figures and what have you. Yeah. So I was wondering if you could share the story of how you actually came to work with them. How did they find you or you find them or what happened there? 
Yeah, that's a that's an interesting. That's a funny story. Well, that that was a wonderful time. First of all, it was an amazing time, and um, um, uh, Chris Anderson, the guy who was the founding uh, guy of the Business Two Point magazine, went on to buy the uh, the TED conference, and he and that's his. He's now running the TED conferences, which is pretty exciting, in its own right. Uh, the um, the way that it began was uh, I at the time. Back in those days, there was kind of like, remember the yellow pages? There were yellow pages. And then there was a there was also kind of a yellow pages for um, illustrated illustration work and uh, design work called the uh, the black book or the workbook. There were a few of them. And the way that you were the way that you uh, got discovered was you took out ads in these books and you showed your work like a it was like a portfolio and our, you know, marketing directors and other people would uh, and uh, magazines would pit, would get these giant books and they would flip through them and your, your phone number would be on there. So this is like before the internet, <laughs> yeah, or before at least before the web, let's say, or you know. So there, back in that time, um, there was no info. No one who did infographics had their stuff in there. There was no infographics in there. So I was one of the first or one of the early people who said, you know, why don't we do a page, a couple pages in this book and we'll show infographics. And I had these um, little uh, stick men and stick people. And I thought, I remember asking a friend of mine, do you think anyone's going to be interested in this, this kind of like, it's a little bit design, it's a little bit, you know, different than what you might think of. Um, and my friend said, yeah, go for it, put it in there. And I put in this little ant people, we call them the stick figures drawing. And I got a call from the art director of this magazine, Business 2.0, saying, hey, uh, we have this idea for a magazine. Um, our editor came out of Wired. It's a previous, uh, Jim Daly was his name. He'd been a Wired guy. And uh, we have this idea of a magazine that is just completely filled with infographics. And we want to have something that is signature or unique or we want it to feel different. We want to feel, you know, unique. And we really think that you're, you know, would you be up for, would you be interested in, like, we don't have a lot of money, but would you be interested in, you know, we're making a prototype to show advertisers. Would you do some, you know, diagrams and, you know, maybe we can pay you a little bit. And I was like, yeah, sure. We'll do that. Let's do that. And um, we, uh, uh, the rest is history. I mean, that that became almost like the iconic magazine of that era. And we, well, it was fascinating because we ended up, the stuff that we were visualizing was all the stuff that we take for granted today. We were visualizing, you know, uh, how, how, how is, uh, how is web activity measured? I mean, how is it tracked? We were visualizing software agents. What's a software agent? What's a bot? What does it do? Um, all, you know, everything, sock puppets, everything that we now like have come to, re, you know, just kind of uh, recognize as everyday life. We were trying to imagine. I remember we did one about Amazon. It's like inside, it was called Inside the E-Tail Mall. <laughs> and I remember that one. You do. Okay. Well, we couldn't tell anybody it was about Amazon, but we weren't allowed to say at the time that it was about Amazon. But it was like this, you know, how it happens. And you had the customer experience on one side. And you had the inch, what happens inside the company to support that the factory, customer. right? The, the factory drawing, I believe, yeah. Yeah, and it was so it was really it was fascinating because of course we were we were at the leading edge talking to all the smartest people about all the most interesting thing that was happening uh, that were happening at the time, and we, we so we really became very knowledgeable about uh, e business and e commerce and the, just the whole you know the, the web and the, how the web was enabling businesses and. I think it's been, um, and we've, we, over the period of time that we're working, we try and maintain that lead, that leading edge. And so we've, we're working with companies and we're almost always living in the future because we're drawing and visualizing the stuff that's, they're going to be coming out with in two or three years or even one year. So we're always seeing the future. And that's kind of fun too, because uh, we're, you know, when the future does come, you know, like, you know, then we're like, oh yeah, I remember I drew that two years ago, you know, I drew a picture of that. Like, uh, or if it doesn't happen the way that you happen, you also, you learn interesting things from that. And you, so I, I'd say we've learned almost as much from the failures that we've seen as we have from the successes that we've seen. And, if, and so we are, we, that this does put us, put us in a pretty good position to advise as well. Our clients is like, you know, 
do you really think this? I mean, are you going to really you're going to compete with Google here? And you make motorcycles now? Are you sure? You know, are you sure you won't be better off making friends with Google? Because you know you might, you know, you might have some problems. Um, and so I made that one up. But you have the basic. You know, you have. Um, there are things that we've learned. We, it does put us in a position where we are uh, at least able to recognize relatively big errors and, and perhaps help with some course correction before it's too late. Awesome. Uh, so it's been, yeah, it's a blast. Yeah, it's, it's a really great story. I'm so glad I, I, I got to ask that and finally hear that. I hadn't thought about it. We're way over the first segment. And if I had Skype open right now, Brandy would have been giving me the hook like every couple of seconds. <laughs> but this is a really awesome story. So thank you so very much, Dave. Uh, for sharing it with me. I'm going to go ahead and wrap up this segment right now, and we're going to break and come back in a second. But um, okay. uh, this is Chris Heuer for CXD Now, uh, Customer Experience Design Now, and I've had the pleasure here so far of talking with Dave Gray, your friend, mentor, advisor, and one of the leading people in the world in customer experience design. I've just shared some of his thoughts on how he got there and accidentally explained that he knows a motorcycle company that he's working for that's going to compete with Google. <laughs> so, oh, well. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. There isn't such a client. He just made it up. Uh, that's what he does because he's a creative guy and he is an Imagineer at heart. Um, so thank you very much, Dave, for joining us. Um, really thank appreciate you. it. And thank you again to IBM Commerce for sponsoring the show. And uh, their new Journey Designer product is out now for you to try. You can check out the links from cxdnow.com. And uh, look forward to seeing you again here in just a moment.